Are we armed for battle? And with respect to the sermon activity, Joe responded with Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And Joe's thoughts on that passage were, we need the full armor of God. Just having one part will help, but you'll not be complete. You need the belt of truth, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. But Paul rounds out his statement by concluding to pray. Pray all the time in all moments and keep him in prayers in this case as well. Prayer to me says that we have a powerful God. We need to keep him close to us in our everyday life. We can have all the tools, but without God, we're helpless. And he didn't know it, but that segued into my first passage. In Numbers chapter 14, we're in a situation. Israel has come out of Egypt. God has brought them out. He used 10 plagues to do it. And actually, no, he didn't do 10 plagues to bring them out. He did the 10 plagues to show not only Egypt, but to show the Israelites that he was God. And didn't stop there. When they leave Egypt, the only way they can flee from the Egyptians is through the water. God parts the water. They pass on dry ground. And then not only do they get to pass on dry ground, but God defeats the entire Egyptian army. Not a single Israelite has to fight because God does it for them. The water comes crashing back in. God destroys an entire army for them. Then after they leave, oh, we don't have food. Oh, we're so hungry. Here's manna. God provides them. Food for every single day of the week. Oh, but we don't have, well, I want a hamburger. So God provides them quail. Now they got meat to eat. And he says, okay, we're at the promised land. And the spies go in and they come back. Wow, you should have seen it. It was awesome. See this thing? And there's two guys that got poles going between the two of them. Hanging down from that pole is a cluster of grapes. I mean, me, the biggest cluster of grapes I've had has only been about that long, which is pretty cool seeing a cluster of grapes that's about a foot and a half long. But they had a single cluster of grapes that was hanging from the pole down to the ground. This is a rocking place. Happy to be there. And God told them, this is the promised land. I am giving it to you. And 10 out of the 12 said, no way, Jose. They're just way too big. They're going to crush us. We're all going to die. So when we pick up Numbers 14, 1 through 4, it says, So all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. And the people wept that night, and all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt. If only we had died in this wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims would it not have been better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let's select a leader and return to Egypt. Like I said, how many Egyptians had the Israelites fought in battle? Zero. So if they didn't have to fight any Egyptians in battle, what in the world are they thinking when they're saying, oh no, we're gonna lose in battle? 
What battle are you planning on fighting? When you've got a God that is willing to go before you in such a way, fact is, he's still there right now. I'm, I'm sorry, not right now now, but back then right now. They had the pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night that they're still following. It's not like God had disappeared. And even with the pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, this is where they're at. Jumping down farther in that chapter, verse 39, Then Moses told these words to all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly, and they rose early in the morning and went up to the top of the mountain, saying, Here we are, and we will go to the place which the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. Moses let him know, you are so doing the wrong. God has shown himself to be God, and what are you doing? Fine. You don't want to go? You don't have to go. The spies were in the land for 40 days. For every day they were in the land, that's a year you're going to be stuck wandering in this wilderness. Promised land is not for you. You're all going to die. Because... Oh, they're all going to kill us. Fine. You're going to die in the desert. Die in the wilderness. You're just going to wander around for the next 40 years. And when all of you that are over 20 years old, adults enough to make a good decision, and you made a bad one, are dead. Your children are the ones, those that were 20 years and younger, and those that will be born in the wilderness, they're the ones that get the promised land because you couldn't handle it. Oh, oh, we're going to change your mind. We're going to do what we're going to do as though ignoring the consequence fixes it. What happens when you give kids consequence for doing wrong, and instead of the consequence going through, they try to make it right by doing what they were told to do to begin with? Are they really learning the lesson, or are they getting away with it, sort of? Truth? Getting away with it, and we know that. Israel tried to get away with it. Oh, we're so sorry. We shouldn't have said no to God. So we're going to change what we're doing. And Moses said, Now why do you transgress the command of the Lord? For this will not succeed. Do not go up lest you be defeated by your enemies. For the Lord is not among you. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword because you have turned away from the Lord. The Lord will not be with you. Guess what? Moses doesn't deny what the spies said. Yeah, the land is filled with big battens, and they got swords, and they know how to use them. What are you? You all are a bunch of sheep herders. You were the slaves that helped build the pyramids. How many of you have been trained in using a weapon? They'd probably cut themselves rather than cut the enemy, not knowing what they were doing. And if you go without God, good luck, because you were right. That land is filled with violent nasties. They are going to cut you down. And being the headstrong, stupid people that they were, they ignored Moses. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who dwelt in that mountain came down, attacked them, and drove them back as far as Hormah. What caused the Israelites to die in battle? It wasn't the enemy. Yes, it was. Did God kill a single Israelite that day? No. He let the Israelites face the world on the world's terms, and the world wiped them. When they went without God, there was consequence. And I appreciated a couple of things this morning, and I can't get into everything. I appreciated the song that Joe led. He leadeth me. And we sing it. Do we follow it the way Israel followed God? Or do we follow it the way it says here? Where I, whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. What was Israel trying to do? Israel was trying to get God to go their way. Oh, well, we don't want to face that. So come on, God, we're going to go a different way. 
Oh, well, now that we're going to get in trouble, well, we don't want to deal with the consequences, so come on, God, we're going to go this way instead now. That's not an example of God leading. That was, that was an example of them trying to drag God along their way. Parents, is that how parenting works? Do we let the kids drag us along their way? No. Ends up terribly. We know better. And God knows we know better. Jumping to Luke, the passage that's already been read. Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. That's the focal point. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve, whom he also called, named apostles, Simon, whom he also called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called the Zealot, Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. But like I said, he went to the mountain to pray and he continued all night in prayer. That was his focus. His focus is getting into a one-to-one -one situation, talking to God, the Father, making sure what's about to happen is the way I need to be going forward. And it wasn't just him. Because if you think about the 12, what are they doing? When they become his apostles, when they become the ones following him that directly. We know that Peter and a couple of the other ones were fishermen, not after they followed Jesus. They left the family business behind. They left their salary. They left their guaranteed income and followed. Matthew, the tax collector, an official kind of job. He's working for the government. You know he's on easy street, President Account for. Um, because I do IT with UF, so I'm sort of working for the government in a weird way. I know I've got a job. I know I've got a retirement. And Joe's down here chuckling because he knows that kind of situation. Work for the government? Oh yeah, you got the job. It takes forever for them to fire you. So, real job, real money, guaranteed, coming in. We're not sweating it like Chad. Chad's actually got to make a profit. He sells stuff, he does stuff, and if people don't buy, oh, oh, he's in trouble. So if Chad leaves his behind, that's not as bad because he doesn't have the guarantee Joe and I do. They left their jobs, they left the security of that income and followed. That's a pretty serious follow. That's a pretty hefty kind of commitment. And let's just think for a moment back with the Israelites. On one side with the Israelites, you saw 10 plagues performed by God. You've got the parting of the waters performed by God. You got an entire army destroyed performed by God. You've got quail, you've got manna showing up on the ground every morning performed by God. Oh, and just because God's awesome, they didn't just leave Egypt. He told them, when you go out, ask, ask for good clothing. Ask for gold, ask for silver, ask for pretty much anything because they're going to give it to you. When Israel left Egypt, they left with the spoils of Egypt. They didn't leave as slaves, they left wealthy. <laughs> this is the kind of God you want to follow. Except, Except, no, 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 no. God, you, you don't understand. They've got big swords over there. And then the other column, that's what the apostles had seen up to that point in Jesus' ministry. They've seen him healing. They saw him turn the water to wine. And they saw all the fish that got caught that one day. When he said, put your net down the other side, and they did, and it was enough to cause the boats to start to sink. Those are the miracle types they've seen from Jesus. Put on a scale, Jesus' side's on the light side. <laughs> Moses and Israel's side was pretty heavy with some pretty impressive miracles. And yet, 
Who was willing to follow no matter the cost? And who wasn't? Matthew 5, 27 through 30. This isn't an easy passage. And we'll go through it. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you should not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than your whole body be cast into hell. And I say this is a hard passage because unfortunately we approach it wrong and we get the wrong message from it. We get the idea that, oh, well, he's just giving in an extreme example that that's how critical sin is and we should be approaching sin as though it's that critical. No, we're not paying attention to what he said. When he said causes, that word could also have been translated force as far as if your right hand forces you to sin. Not meaning you're led into sin by what you saw, lust of the eye. Not because what that felt like was just oh so good, lust of the flesh. Causes, forces. We're talking addiction. If you are out of control and sin has so mastered you, wouldn't you give your eye or your hand to gain some kind of control back in your life? With addicts, drug addicts, one in 10 today can get through recovery successfully. One in 10, that's not good odds. Of that one in 10, they will between seven and 13 times relapse. I didn't say the average number of relapses is somewhere between seven and 13. What I said is one in 10 who will actually be able to overcome the addiction. For those that do, they will relapse between seven and 13 times. When something has that much control over you and you fail fighting against it, who here is good for trying seven times and abjectly failing miserably because the drug has a hold of you that hard? The truth is, there's a reason why only one in 10, and that's today. When we've got additional medications to help you overcome the drug addiction itself, when we've got additional understanding about psychology and behavior modification, where we can help you overcome the behavior you've become adapted to. That's with today's science. When Jesus spoke it, if you were addicted, you were going down. If you were going down, it wasn't a maybe. It was going to cost you everything. He wasn't playing around with he with it when he said, better to lose the hand than to go to hell. One way ticket. Better to lose the eye than to go to hell. One way ticket. Do you like the odds of one in 10? It hasn't gotten much better. Unfortunately, we tend to soft sell how bad sin is. Because when we're talking drug addiction, Porn is a drug addiction. Marital infidelity, like porn, becomes a drug addiction. There are chemicals that get released in your brain that for the adulterer, statistically speaking, if you have one 
affair with one other person, they may be able to help you. If you have more than one affair with more than one partner, you have zero chance. The chemical addiction, the mental addiction, the desire, the things you are not fixing in your life, you're going down. You become a serial committer of inappropriate relationships because the sin has mastered you. Think about the lists of sins that we tend to read in Scripture. Adultery is there. It's there for a reason. It's there because you're going to go down for the count. Porn. Lust of the eye. You're going down for the count. Because it's not just the eye that's going on. It's the chemicals released in the brain. It's a whole lot of other things. Sin is super bad and nasty. And if you want an understanding of how bad and nasty it is, in a different town, in a different denomination, a youth minister on a Sunday morning. So it's the best kids that are there. Because the best kids are the ones that show up Sunday mornings. You can get some of the others to show up Wednesday nights. But to get them to show up Sunday morning, that's extra special. So it's the extra goods that are there. And the youth minister asked them, suppose you only had one hour to live. What would you do? And he's thinking, oh, they're going to say all the good things. And some of the kids said all the good things. Oh, I tell these people that I love them. Oh, I would do this and I would do that good kind of deed. As though doing a good deed in your last hour changes your life. But then there was this other pocket of kids. And this pocket of kids included some of the prominent members' kids. And they're sort of quiet. Go ahead. What is it you're thinking? They huddle for a little bit. When you say, what would be the thing we do? Are we allowed to do anything? I mean, is the illegal okay? And the youth minister is a bit floored because he doesn't know kids that well. After a pause, well, okay, we'll, we'll leave out illegal. What about immoral? And when the youth minister's eyes went from saucer size to full plate size, never mind, never mind, this isn't worth it. Kids that were there on Sunday morning in the church, children of pillars of the church, as far as they were concerned goes, if I only had one hour to live, is it okay to do the immoral? Could I do something that might even be illegal? That's where their minds were at. That's the kind of world we live in. And I'm not pointing at the kids now, I'm pointing at the world. We live in a world that every place you turn is being crafted. Oh, well, you got to understand. I mean, yes, this person has an immoral disposition in the following year, but if they're so heroic, if they've sacrificed so much, then don't they deserve to have their little bit of happy? That's how it's being packaged when it comes to an alternative lifestyle. I don't care what letter you pick. They're out there flooding the entertainment industry as far as the movies. The TV programs, it's in the songs, it's even in comics. Some of which have made it into the newspapers to just, as, as opposed to just on the internet. And sometimes it's easier to see that kind of sin because, well, that's not the one I'm tempted by, so yeah. Obviously, people are being fooled when it's that particular kind of sin, because who could fall for that? What about the sins that we're tempted by. Do we recognize it as scary enough that, wow, how could I fall for that? Or are we in the same category of, well, I've suffered. And okay, I know it's wrong, but shouldn't I be allowed to feel better about myself? Two wrongs don't make a right, I know, but 
I've been through so much. Don't I deserve a break? Satan isn't putting it out there blunt ugly. He doesn't put it out as a big pile of cow patties and say, hey folks, time to chow down. Doesn't this look good? Just hold your nose. Eat enough of it, it'll fill your belly. That's not how he makes sin look. He makes sin look right. He makes sin look justifiable. He makes sin look like you're entitled to it. And he doesn't wait till you're an adult to start attacking. Because he puts it out there in the public school system when they're not even in fourth grade. And they will lobby to make sure that the young child under fourth grade level knows it's okay. Uh, here's the details on how to do it. There was a time when that was considered illegal. Now that's educational. Sin is on full scale war. We don't have to go halfway around the world to be on the battlefield. It's right here. And it's, it's terrifying to know that it does go all the way down into the school system at that young an age. And yet, like Joe said, we sometimes, well, he didn't say this part of it, but sometimes we get comfortable. The only part I really need to worry about is. So this is the part of scripture I'm going to worry about applying in my life. And what's the example you're showing to your kids? What's the example you're showing to your neighbor? What's the example you're showing even to your spouse? Because what's going on inside of your head, they're not seeing that. They were seeing your actions and the results of that and they're making decisions. And okay, sorry, this is only for the older ones here <clears throat> because the older ones are the only ones that are gonna remember it. Remember the kid picture, a picture, the commercials when you'd have that little kid and dad does whatever and the kid does it too. Dad lathers up his face to shave and the kid lathers up his face and does this with his fingers. And dad does something else and the kid does something else. And the last thing you saw was dad sitting under the tree, takes out his packet of cigarettes, lights up, sets the packet down on the ground. And the last thing you saw is the kid looking over at the pack of cigarettes. The message was a public health kind of thing. They were just starting to realize smoking leads to cancer oftentimes. This isn't the example you want to give because they're watching. The whole world's watching. What's the message we're showing? People are making decisions. Well, it's okay for rich. So it must be okay for me. It's okay for my dad, it must be okay for me. They're my friend, they're a good person. If that's what they think is acceptable, it must be fine. They're sleeping in on Sunday. Church can't be that important because they're a good person and they're not there today. I'm gonna close with John 16, eight through 11. And when he has come, referring to the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. They will be convicted of sin when they see the right answer in us. They will be convicted of righteousness when they see the right answer in us. 
and they will know there is judgment because in seeing the sin and in seeing the right they themselves will know there's a difference and have to make a choice do we believe sin is dangerous enough that we need to be fighting it do we put on the full armor of God because we're convicted that if we don't, like it said in Scripture, that armor isn't there for show? Like Chad said, there was a time when that kind of armor meant you were living in a world of blood. You're going to see it in a lot of places, a lot of places, including the battlefield. We're in a battlefield. Just because we don't see the spiritual blood on the floor, just because we don't see those who've been taken down who are sitting in the pews, doesn't change that reality. Are we convicted enough to not just pray thy will be done, but to take it up, study it, and have his will done in our lives based on his word. We each have a choice to make. For many, that choice begins, well, no, I'm sorry, take that out. That choice begins when we take on Christ in baptism. When we say yes to God. When we respond in good conscience that if that's what you desire, that is so what I'm doing. Because that's a simple thing. Striving to overcome the sin that's in my life, the things that are pulling me away from God, because the cost of sin, that's been paid for. I don't have to worry about the sin of yesterday. Christ's blood covered that. What I have to worry about is the sin that's getting to my heart that is pulling me farther and farther away from where I need to be. Sin leads to death. It can't cause it because of Calvary. When it draws you far enough away, you've rejected God. The Israel that we read about in Numbers had rejected God. They claim belief, but claiming it isn't the same as actually acting on it. Our action begins in baptism, but it continues every day of our lives. We can't be comfortable with putting on the helmet and saying, I'm done, I'm good, I'm covered. The full arm. The willingness to act. If you need to take on Christ in baptism or you need the prayers of the church, you're welcome to come as we stand and sing.